Hello, everybody. Welcome to the in-house perspective panel. I'm Gary Barnett. I'm the executive director and general counsel of the International Legal Finance Association. Uh, I'd like to thank Broad Rugnick for putting on this conference and having me uh, as a moderator of what I believe to be will be a quite interesting panel. Uh, we heard on the last panel of the investor's perspective and how with the kind of economic environment uh, and kind of some of the uncertainties uh, in it uh, will kind of drive investment interest in the asset class. And this panel is kind of looking more on the demand side and in particular the kind of corporate perspective as legal finance provides a risk management and a liquidity benefit to corporations. And those are two things that are increasingly important important to corporations in a kind of tougher economic environment. Before we go into the conversation, I wanted to allow the panelists to introduce themselves, and I'll start with Suber. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name's Suber Akther. I'm um, head of litigation for a small German engineering company, Siemens, in the UK. Um, I've been with them now 17 years, so I'm counting down another 23 before I leave. Um, just on a personal note, I'm a solicitor advocate, but I am actually transferring to the bar very shortly, and I'm doing that for one reason mainly, which is uh, never to have to answer the question which all British Bangladeshis, particularly my snooty in-laws, always ask, which is, so when will you become a barrister? To, to avoid, I will stay in-house with Siemens, but I will become a barrister shortly. My name is Rocco Pirazzolo. I'm the underwriting director of uh, Harbour Underwriting. I've been in the after event insurance market since early 2000, had a short stint out for two and a half years in litigation funding, but saw the errors of my way and came back to ATE. <laughs> uh, I'm Andrew Jones. I'm a director at uh, Fortress Investment Group. Uh, I entered the litigation funding market uh, in 2017 at Vanin Capital before uh, some of us moved across to, to Fortress uh, a year or so ago. Uh, I spent most of my private practice career as a litigator at Freshfields with a um, brief uh, stint at Linklater's as well. And I also feel very well, com uh, very well qualified to speak on the in-house perspective, having done a three-month secondment at Barclays in 2008. And I'm still the founder of the founder <laughs> uh, and it's not been now 22 years since I've known it's still 21. Um, and I was also for three years a diplomat for the British government, which was hugely entertaining in Atlanta. So I think to start off with, uh, we'll start with our resident in-house expert, Suber, uh, with the question on the current economic pressure on litigation and what you're hearing from your general counsel and CFO. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one of the things is people ask, well, what's a litigation budget? It's very difficult for an, a corporate to have a litigation budget as such. You can have a wider legal budget because you can have headcount and you can freeze recruitment and control that. But litigation uh, a budget is very difficult to A, define and uh, establish because it very much depends on what kind of disputes you get. Uh, one or two major disputes can completely skewer the figures that you would have for litigation. But to answer your question, Gary, there's always pressure um, to reduce costs overall, whether it's the overall legal budget within which falls the litigation expenditure. And so we're always under pressure to try and find ways of saving costs, doing things differently, more efficiently, uh, and uh, um, either avoiding or managing disputes in the most cost-effective way. Um, and that will always depend on specifics, and one of the issues may be um, litigation funding to help with that. Is the, are you getting any feelings with the current economic environment? Is, is any kind of the conversations that you're having internally, have they changed at all? Um, focuses often change. So, for example, trying to anticipate where your disputes, what type of disputes, and where to um, allocate resources. So at the moment, you know, we project there will be quite, and we are experiencing this insolvency area is one that's growing, and so we're focusing on um, uh, protecting ourselves from whether it's contractual provisions and uh, cash flow and managing security through to actually enforcement and so on. 
thought I could open it up to the rest of the panel for them to talk about what they're hearing in their conversations with corporates on the economic pressure, but also just generally uh, what they're hearing from corporates on their litigation budgets and, and, and their interest in, in utilizing legal finance. We can start with um, Rocco. Yes, I mean, it's, it's always a positive sign, I think, when you hear GCs thinking about the options open to them and uh, to the business. And I appreciate that the conversation might start with the GC, but really it's, it's a conversation with the finance director, with the board. So, but nonetheless, it's always good when a GC is thinking about other ways of approaching the funding of litigation. And certainly one of the experiences I had was when this, um, the GC, he was looking at litigation funding as an option. He was looking at pure insurance solution after he meant insurance, uh, looking at the types of cover that an AT insurer can provide, not just adverse costs, but looking at cover for disbursements, for solicitors' fees. And they were looking at all those ramifications, and I knew they had separate conversations going on with the litigation funder. And obviously they were contemplating it doing as they always did and historically, which is just pay and take the exposure to adverse costs. Um, so I, I think in a way there's still a lot of um, interest in litigation funding and after event insurance. I'd like it to be more than just a conversation where both of those are just of interest. Rather than being an intellectual exercise, I'd like it to move slightly beyond that um, because obviously when you're dealing with people like Suba, they, they totally understand what they're listening to, but there's, there has to sort of move to the next phase. And whether, you know, and having some type of um, openness to doing things differently. And Andrew and Susan, what do you guys uh, think? Uh, I mean, I, I think that's, that's absolutely right. Um, you know, what what you hear time and again is is that you know broad awareness of of litigation funding litigation funders what we can what we can do well that sounds really interesting uh, that's 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 all great um, but probably just not really something that that we're really interested in right now um, I think a, a familiar refrain when it comes to single cases is um, you know, we don't really need funding because if the case is good enough for you to fund, it's good enough for us to fund, um, uh, which is obviously you know, perfectly fair. Um, but uh, I, I completely agree that it would be great for all of us if uh, if we moved on to the next level. I mean, uh, as I said, I, I moved um, into funding uh, in 2017 and, and, and it's remarkable how much the market has moved in, in that time. Um, I think I was sort of having internal conversations back then uh, about how corporates should be the sort of the big focus because we've kind of, you know, there's been an education process of, of, of law firms by that, that time. Um, and, you know, in five years' time, corporates are going to be where it's at. Well, we're now sort of nearly six years on from that, and I think, yeah, definitely things have moved on. Um, but it would be, you know, fantastic if uh, if if we went further. So, I mean, as funders, obviously, we see the same things with budgets as in-house lawyers do, and I have to struggle to not get just a little bit rabid about this because. I still see ridiculous bills for administrative tasks that should be much less than they are. And I'm not quite sure, I don't understand why all GCs don't unionize and get together and say, hey, we've had enough of this. We've had enough of how this is being done. And the whole thing, to Suba's point about, it's very difficult to figure out what a budget is, should be for a case. No, it's not. And the problem, and we were referring to data in the previous session, is that law firms are not, and I'm going to make myself deeply unpopular now, but um, are not enough looking back, collecting their data, understanding how they did when it came to estimating and budgeting, and therefore doing a better job at sticking with that and, and, and just doing a better job for their clients. And of course we see that because we are funding these cases. 
And when we look back at our data, 21 years worth, what do we find? We find that claim values come in on average at about 30% of what we were told they would be. Budgets are always at or over, even when we build contingencies in. It is, it, I just don't understand how that can't get better. And, you know, Andrew's talking about, well, we see it was the corporates after five years. I feel terribly sorry for corporates because I think they have the same issues that we have. And it makes, it does, you cannot say you're a good litigator if you're not good at the budgeting. The two have to go hand in hand. And we just need to see people doing better. I know there's a whole review about budgeting at the moment going on and, and lawyers who come out with some extraordinary phrases about, oh, you know, and, and it feels like that these are, this word estimate always, it's not, it's not a, it's not anybody, nobody feels that they ought to try and stick to it or warn if there are issues coming up. And it's always this, well, we don't know how the defence is going to behave. Well, come on, you've been doing this for a very, very long time. Within reason, within a margin, you should be able to say how you do. And, and I think that that's, we've made n almost no progress on that. And I think the job of a, of a GC or an in-house lawyer is incredibly difficult. And it just needs to be much better than it is. Can I, can I just clarify anything, if it was a misunderstanding um, on my part? When I said it's difficult to have a litigation budget, what I didn't mean was case specific. I think sort of an annual budget is very difficult to say for litigation this. It just depends on cases. But you're absolutely right, Susan. If we have a major case, I can only speak on behalf of Siemens, and we invite, let's say, pitches from three firms, I will send out akin to a, um, a cost budget that you would have to file in court as part of the response from the law firm so that we can compare like with like for each stage of the litigation process uh, as opposed to just leave it free fall Well, you give us what you think is a budget with hundreds of caveats. So we do try get, uh, uh, I agree with you that we can and we do try and control budget and get very good estimates but all I was saying was for a, an annual basis um, it's impossible to say what your budget is. Shubha, you mentioned to me a judgment enforcement that you had conversations with a couple of funders about potentially seeking funding or seeking assistance in that. Can you sort of elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it follows on. I was here last year, and thank you for inviting me back. So I'm trying to think of something new to say so that I might get invited back next year, otherwise you know, I'd just repeat the same thing. But, I, I asked amongst my colleagues um, you know, what experience we've had, and we had one particular case where we had an award uh, in excess of 50 million US dollars, um, and then we looked at the enforcement bit, which was tricky, and uh, we had, for example, um, Anchor looking into asset tracing and so on, but there just wasn't, on that case, maybe it was one-off, the appetite from third-party funders to take the risk because if we are having difficulty extracting money from these people who are just running around and may not have the assets, I think that's the same view that the um, third party funders were taking. And that goes back to the point that I made last year, which is if it's a meritorious case and it has good prospects of recovery as well as uh, judgment or award, then Siemens has the financial means to fund that and it will do a cost benefit analysis. Well, what will it cost us? through the traditional procurement route, even possibly with the CFA, and what does it benefit us in real terms with third party funding. Um, so if it's a meritorious case, we want to keep the winnings, it's having your, you know, it's the Boris Johnson having your cake and eating it. We want to keep the winnings. If it's a rubbish case, then would you mind third party <laughs> funders taking it? Um, <laughs> but but the, the one point I'd like to add, it may be covered later, is one of the other points was, well, why don't you have um, portfolio funding? So you have good cases, bad cases, and do that, and if you, especially if you've got smaller cases. You have to understand how corporates works and how they're set up. They're almost on a project-by-project project basis. So if I have, uh, you know, we've just finished what you can Google, the Keyed B2 power project that opened yesterday. It's the most efficient in the world at the moment, gas power station. Very challenging during um, COVID times and very successful project. At the same time, I won't mention the less successful ones. We've got others that are basket case managed projects. Now, one team is going to be very loath to say, well, we will subsidize the poorly managed projects 
on a portfolio basis. If I went and said, look, we've got five disputes here, let's get a third party funder, they will help deal with all of it. I'm quite keen to try these things, but it's a real hard sell to the project director whose bonuses will depend on what returns he makes on that project to say, well, actually, yeah, I will, you know, sub as I said, subsidize one that isn't doing so well um, to balance out the interest of the third party fund. And those are, you know, the kind of challenges that we have in getting from an aspiration, as you said, to actual instruction. So it might be helpful to pull back a little bit and talk more about or, or discuss a little bit about the, kind of the products and services that legal finance providers do offer. There is the asset recovery piece that I think that some funders uh, do provide that kind of expertise and service. There's portfolio financing. Andrew, I don't know if you wanted to talk about that a little bit. Uh, well, I mean, I think um, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to um seek to educate in a room full of people who are in this market as to what the products are going to be because they're pretty well known. But um, you know, the, the most plain vanilla of the of things available to a corporate would be the single case litigation um, funding. So you know, we, we um, take the, the, the cost and the risk uh, in exchange for a share of the proceeds. Um, we talked about portfolio transactions. Um, that's something that has kind of um, has has been done, and we'd love to do more of them. Um, but you kind of you know, you're bundling up um, a large group of of claims uh, where you know, we as the funder might uh, advance a percentage of the expected damages from those claims uh, in return for a for a first outright from the from the proceeds, and you sort of cross collateralize across that 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 portfolio. Um, and then the, the, the third one that's open to, um, to corporates, again, being sort of very simplistic here, um, is, is what Super mentioned, is the, the award monetization. So you know, you, you've, you've, you've got your judgment or your arbitral award. Um, it's taken you some time to get there. Uh, you don't really fancy taking on you know, the further cost duration of, uh, of, of uh, enforcing or going through appeals. And the risk of it being overturned, so um, we will effectively buy that off of the the, the corporate um, for a certain number of pence in the pound, and and take on that risk. Um, in all likelihood, work with an insurer as part of um, uh, managing our own risk uh, on that. But um, the the corporate effectively steps away at that time with some some money in its pocket. And Rocco, from the harbor underwriting perspective. We want to touch a little bit on kind of what you guys offer. Yes, so um, certainly we, we, we and, and, and I want to talk about also slightly broader than harbour underwriting, but you know, effectively um, when you look at AT, you're looking at cover for adverse costs, you're at cover for disbursements, cover for solicitors' fees, which doesn't get much of veneering. Um, dealing with security for costs by way of anti-avoidance endorsements or, and or deeds of indemnity. Uh, cross undertaking in damages insurance for when the action requires something like a freezing order. Um, but fundamentally, whatever we're talking about, whether it's an insurance solution or a litigation funding solution, the, you know, it's all about a, an appetite for risk. and. Uh, Subal would know only too well from his panel law firms, uh, as would any other GC, that they don't give guarantees. And uh, a 60% prospects of succeeding is a 40% chance of being exposed to adverse costs, wasting your own money on your own solicitors, on disbursements, etc., etc. So much of what we are offering here is about acknowledging and trying to recognise within an organisation an appetite for risk. And some, you know, some companies, some businesses, some claimants will always say, well, you know, I, if my lawyer thinks it's a good case, I'm happy to run it and I'm happy to take the downside. Well, someone like that will never find necessarily litigation funding or AT insurance wildly attractive. But others will. And the, the reality is there will be those who will look at what we're offering on this panel as something that's worth considering and being open to. And 
a way of managing risk. And so, to, to a greater or less extent, I'm talking to that because it's so easy to talk about what we can offer. But what we're not talking about is to what extent that discussion internally within a business is happening about what's our tolerance to risk? Do we want to lay off some of this risk with a litigation funder, uh, with uh, an 18 insurer? Uh, and I think to a greater or less extent, we, we can talk at great lengths about what we're all capable of offering. And, and, and you know, I will say that the, the range of the range of products is widening all the time. But the reality is there is a discussion which has to happen, and it goes beyond the GC. It goes to the finance director, it goes to the board. It goes much wider. Is there a better way, a cleverer way, a way that acknowledges us as a profile, our profile to risk? Is there a way that we can approach this differently? I think it'd be a good... Uh question for, for Suber to, to respond to. But before we do that, I mean, there's non-monetary benefits as well of working with a, with a funder. I didn't know if Susan, if, you, if there's anything you wanted to add to what either Rocco or Andrew said, but also kind of touch on the non-monetary Yeah, I mean, I mean slightly tongue in cheek, because I don't want everybody sending all their cases to us but in, in <laughs> one way. But it's in some ways, it's like, why wouldn't you take your case to a litigation funder? It doesn't cost anything to get that view. And we're all highly experienced. I'm a much better lawyer now than I ever was in practice. I feel a bit sorry for the clients I had then, because I'm just much better at looking at things. And to get that view, that quick view that we're so because we get so many inquiries we're really good at and then also back to sorry to be bored but about the the budgeting side of things if, if there's sort of and, and also the, the fact that we run so many cases and we have such exposure to who's the really good people in the market to run cases and and crucially this point about value um, value is consistently significantly overestimated and it's that which causes a problem whether you're an in-house lawyer or a funder that part way through somebody says oh I need to double the budget but hey the values declined and oh can you reduce your terms please that's a sort of worst of all worlds scenario that we find ourselves in so I think there's a massive benefit to just coming and seeing what we think because it costs nothing to do so and we know that people do that but that's okay because it's an educational piece and to Rocco's point, it's hopefully showing them that we can actually be a sensible partner. And I know Gary's going to talk a bit about control later. And also to realise that we do not and cannot control the way in which the litigation is there. But of course, we're interested in, in seeing good outcomes. So it, it's a, sort of a no-brainer, I think. So I mean, I, I was yeah. just sort of thinking about pick, picking up on one of those points, which is that from the corporate perspective, you know, Subar as a as a as a as a GC or the CFO, you're an investor in the litigation just like we are. It's a question of whether or not you're going to use the company's money to invest in it, or you're going to bring that money in for, from elsewhere. But either way, the questions that you need to be asking yourselves are exactly the same. You know, are, how much is it going to cost? Are we going to win? Are we going to make money out of it at the at the end of it? And um, as Susan said, like you're know, getting a, a you know a free view on that. Um, with the benefit experience is, is, yeah, um, is a no-brainer. And I think the other point that I make is that you know, these are, you know, Siemens obviously is a, a totally international um, business. Um, yeah, in some cases where, where the corporate might not have such a sort of, or, or the, the, the in-house team might not have such a, um, a broad jurisdictional reach, we, we fund litigation not just in the UK, but um, Elsewhere, I mean, Susan uh, describes herself as a, as a better lawyer now than she ever was. That may be the same w with me. Definitely, I know more about Dutch law, German law, Italian law, Spanish law than, than I ever did in, in private practice because we fund cases in all of those jurisdictions. Um, and we have, we have you know, good contacts in all of those jurisdictions. And so um, being able to sort of pick the brains uh, of people who aren't charging by the hour. God, the law firms are really going to hate us on this. But, um, but, but pick our brains on, on that sort of thing and make introductions and give a view on those sorts of cases as well, I think, is, is helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, so how much of those conversations happening that kind of Rocco mentioned and what can the legal finance industry do 
to try to facilitate that happening more often? I mean, in terms of non-monetary benefits, it is huge. And there's two aspects in my view. One is real and practical, and one is perception. So in terms of real and practical is um, litigation funders will have a lot more experience and expertise than the entity litigating. You even seem as an experienced litigator in different arenas and different fields will not be as experienced as somebody who's funding multiple disputes in those areas. And, um, you know, whether it's selection of experts, whether it's data management, et cetera, et cetera, we often have to reinvent the wheel, whereas you guys will be, you'll know it inside out. So that, those kind of things are of huge benefit. Um, and the one of perception, it goes both ways, as I mentioned before, which is if you have somebody who is funding you um, and has taken a very robust independent assessment, otherwise they're not going to put their money at stake, it gives you that credibility against the other side to say, well, we've got this litigation funder. And I say that because we're often, we have, uh, at least I've been on two occasions, on the receiving end of that message in meeting rooms, um, not so much with third party funding, but with uh, CFAs, where the other side have got ATE insurance and CFA and saying, well, we're litigating risk free effectively. And that's a very powerful message to send, whether it's bluff or not, remains to be seen when the judgment award comes in, but it would be nice to have that in our corner to say, well, again, you know, we'll carry on, we don't need to settle, okay, we might not win, but we're not going to lose as such in terms of costs of litigation and adverse costs orders. So as I say, the actual expertise and experience that you bring is incredibly valuable, I think, and secondly, the perception is. The other bit that uh, uh, you mentioned, um, Andrew, in terms of decision making, just the calculation is quite easy. This is how much roughly it will cost us because we've had a cost budget estimate from the law firm. This is how much we might have to give away depending on the terms of the um, funding agreement. Uh, and you can, you know, the CFOs can do a quick calculation of that. But what they isn't factored in there is those two aspects that I mentioned, the expertise and their perception. And I'll just say one other point. Um, it's not all about the, uh, the money and the figures and so on. A corporate will have quite a few other factors to consider. So for example, reputational issues and deterrence factors and so on are things that um, are probably not factored in or I don't think will be factored in by a litigation funder as much as will be factored in by the corporate entity itself because those things are, those things are personal to the corporate which isn't really of any effect to the third party funder. Or, or it's not wanting to, to be litig litigating against people with whom you have an ongoing commercial yeah. relationship and you're fairly confident that you're going to be able to, exactly. to resolve it without litigation. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. And one thing as a funding industry that we, we try to do is try to get uh, in-house lawyers to think of their litigation as an asset. Is that something that you do and kind of historically, is that, is it, have you increasingly done that or, or not? Um, it won't come as a, a surprise to anybody that litigation is always seen as a drain, it's seen as a negative experience, it's seen as uh, taking away resources from more productive um, activities, so you know, on a large construction project, you've got people who would otherwise be working as project managers, etc. brought in. So I, I understand the concept to say, well, that's a pot of money, but we should have had that anyway. We should, you shouldn't, it should have been an asset that was realized in, in your bank account without having to consider it as an asset to be realized in due course. So it's often a very hard sell to say that a claim, for example, is an asset. It is in reality, but it's tough to sell that. What percentage of your cases are defense side cases as opposed to affirmative side cases? Uh, um, the value of the claims that we defend are lower, but more uh, 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 of greater multiple because often we are main contractor and we'll have lots of subcontractors suing us. So in terms of number of disputes, um, we're defendants more often, but in terms of value, pound-wise of claimants, I'd say 
um, our claims are bigger than the uh, so less claimant but higher value than um, defendants. You already touched a little bit on what goes into the thought process of bringing these affirmative cases. Is there anything else to add to that? And then also the um, kind of your decision to join class a class of case or go on go at it alone as, uh, as well. It, it, well, I haven't got experience of class ones, but we have, our, for example, consortium partners when we're in a, a consortium uh, with other entities on very large projects. And again, uh, we try to maintain our independence and go our own way. Where there is common uh, activity we can do, we will try. But it's, it's often about that project team retaining control of their project and decision making as opposed to um, handing over to the so on the question of control, it's obviously a, a, a big question. It's one that corporates, I think, have when they're talking to, to funders. And I didn't know if any of the, the funders on the, the panel wanted to ad address that point. Uh, I, I'm happy to, to, to do so. I mean, I think that the very first question you, you posed, Gary, was, was what sort of things come up in conversations with, with corporates. And I think that you know, the issue of, of control of, of the litigation is probably the number one um, issue in, in, in their minds. Um, I think that, you know, Susan's already touched upon it. I think, you know, from a funder's perspective, we'd love to be able to control the, the litigation. We'd love to be able to, to kind of get the, you know, get a settlement over the line, if, even though that's not necessarily what everyone else wants. Um, but the reality is that, that we're not allowed to do that. There are, you know, there are rules, laws that, that prohibit that, and those are reflected in our um, funding agreements. Um, and I think to, to kind of thinking about examples of, of this, I mean, one sort of fairly recent one uh, on a case that we're funding, there was a, a, a settlement offer um, that was made um, that the, the law firm running the claim uh, advised uh, in sort of quite a detailed piece of written advice that this was a, a reasonable offer for the client to, to take. Um, but, the, yeah, and, and had it been taken, we as the funder would have, yeah, we'd have got our money back and made, you know, a, a decent profit, maybe not as much as we'd wanted, but, um, but it would have been a, a decent outcome. But from the client's perspective, it was lower than they had anticipated, lower than they had um, indicated to their stakeholders that, that they might get. Um, and, you know, we had a number of conversations a, a about it, um, but ultimately, yeah, it was their decision and they, 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 they didn't take it. Um, the, the kind of, the, the, the sort of further gloss on that is that built into the funding arrangements was, uh, I think, a fairly standard clause, which is that yeah, because we as the funders want people to take reasonable and rational commercial decisions, where you have a settlement offer that is advised as being reasonable by the law firm and, and you don't take it, that's technically a, a breach of the, the agreement. And so we kind of had to have a conversation around that. Um, and you know, our, our view is that, that we didn't want to, to terminate the agreement. We still believed that the litigation was was good and, and, and in fact you know a, a settlement a higher settlement was was entirely possible and it, in fact we ended up um, putting more money into the, the the claim because it you know it could um, it could have got um, bigger and we just did that on slightly more preferential economic terms for us so it kind of was a, a in the end a good outcome for us and hopefully a good outcome for, for for the client but it's just illustrative of the fact that try as I might to have persuaded the the client to take the settlement that yeah, it was their call. Susan? Uh, well, it, I don't know why it brought to mind a, a, an anecdote that we had. I mean, echoing all of those things. We can't. The code of conduct in this jurisdiction is very clear. Uh, our agreements reflect that. Um, actually, you know, you do find yourself in difficult situations. So two examples, one of which was an arbitration which we felt had materially adversely declined and therefore should terminate the funding. We have a mediation provision which says is an independent named mediator to go to to decide whether that was correct, which the funded claimant uh, exercised. And the mediator said, 
No, you should carry on. So we did carry on paying for all of the rest of the case and it lost. And there's nothing that we can do about that. So that was, um, so that was uh, sort of frustrating to be proved right, but only having lost more money. And the other example that we had was uh, we had a case which was against a bank and uh, we won, but we, as per my early description, we won a lot less than the claimants had anticipated there was going to be. The defendant bank filed an appeal and the way that it stood, because it was about a tenth or, or less of what people had expected, but it triggered our entitlement. And the claimants, lovely fellows, um, said, we won't defend this appeal unless you uh, agree to take much less money. And we were, there was nothing we could do, because we had no ability to control, step in, and, and run the appeal, and because it was not an appeal that was ever going to succeed. So we were left in no, with no alternative but to do as they asked. And it, that was a very uh, tricky outcome. But it's, there's nothing we can do about it, and that's what we accept. So for all the people sort of say, oh, you, you're doing this, you're doing that, the non-recourse lost everything if the case loses and the inability to control the way in which the litigation is run is actually a great comfort to, to people like Suba that we can't. And we just have to sit there and kind of grind our teeth and go, well, that's, you know, that was difficult. But it's how we do things because, and here's the, the point, if we get that wrong, and we are found to have controlled the case, mm. then triggers of Champerty and OU controlled me and we for would forfeit all of our return. So we are, all good funders are obsessed about not actually or being seen to control things um, because that's the jeopardy that we face if we get it wrong. So we're very, very careful about that. And I'd just like to add uh, to that. It's, I always find it fascinating. The issue of control always rears its head with funding, not with insurance, which obviously I'm heartened by, because that's the reality. Insurance is a different animal, it's a different beast. But still I am sympathetic to the funding uh, point of view, because when, when, you look at, um, when you look at the dynamics of what's really going on, uh, and the protections are enshrined in the contract. So. Um, but you are the, you're, you, you're driving the litigation, so you're driving the action, you've got your lawyers on the front seat passenger. L the litigation fund and the 18 insurer, we're back seat passengers. That's the analogy I always pull out. But the, when you look at the type of entities that have used litigation funding and used 18 insurance, they are, you know, I've, I've insured banks, insurance companies, FTSE 100, I'll let Andrew and Susan talk to the type of entities that they funded. But you, you can show that these are the type of serial repeat litigators who just wouldn't dream of using 8 insurance or funding if they were really concerned about it. They, they, they got over it. And I, I wonder to what extent this myth has to sort of be dispelled. Um, and I'm not entirely sure how we go about that, but, but it, it feels as if it's a recurring worry, and it's not because it's not a legitimate worry, I hasten to add. I totally get it. But I, I sense that when you look at that community of claimants who've used funding and aid insurance, I think that in itself sort of answers the question. I think if you, if you stop sort of short of the control point, um, actually you know, going back to the non-monetary benefits it's it's around um having sort of conversations throughout the life of a case with people who are kind of you know, on your side whose interests are or should be directly aligned with yours and i think that um that is you know litigation is a pretty bruising experience um and uh and I think being able to sit around a table with, you know, w with a funder, with an insurer and the client and the lawyers to talk about you know, how you approach things best, that's not about control, that's just about you know, bringing out the best strategy to achieve the objective that everybody wants. I mean, I, I agree. I think this um, issue of loss of control is overplayed. Um, and I say it for a couple of reasons. Number one, there isn't a um, conflict of interest here between the funder, if you have a CFO, a lawyer, and mm -hmm. the litigant, the company itself. The, you know, there is common purpose there. So the chances of having a fallout saying, 
we want X and you want Y is unlikely. The possibility exists and it's unlikely. Uh, and secondly, that risk and possibility exists internally all the time anyway. So just as a, an illustration, um, people might think organizations, their, you know, their decision-making processes are simple, clean. They're not. You have, you know, I often see, not quite punch-up, but close to civil war between different um, uh, uh, people within projects. So just a very simple illustration. We had a case where we initially lost, and you have to make a financial provision of X amount, let's say five million pounds. Then we can take it to the next stage, arbitration, or we can try and settle. Once you've made the financial provision, different players come in and they will want to settle so that they can release that amount and it's seen as, oh, we've won this amount. Whereas the project team is thinking, no chance, I don't want to pay anything more because I don't think they're owed that. So it's one side will see it as uh, you know, half glass full and one side will see it half empty. And you have those internal conflicts anyway. The, additional layer of third-party funders is never going to make it any more complicated. If we can get over the internal um, challenges, different points of view, it's very unlikely we will have an issue with the external. So that's why I don't think the loss of control is, is really a big factor. It's one to be considered. Just conscious of time, the, the one thing I, I can make a suggestion on is um, please don't be take the impression that we don't want litigation, we do. It's just that there are challenges that need, you know, there are squares that need to be circled, for example. And the one tip I'd give is if you, you know, for a law firm, if they make a pitch, I would almost voluntarily add a very simple one page, two page, you know, no more than that, of the possibility of litigation funding, even if not asked. Um, we don't specifically ask for it. We will ask a general question, is there anything else you can, uh, suggest by way of dealing with the cost of this dispute. But, uh, you know, it would be good to see people voluntarily saying, well, we can, in conjunction with X, offer this, and these are the benefits, and these are the other issues that you need to think of. Super preempted my uh, last, no, it's I great, I'm glad that you did it. Last uh, um, wrap up question for Super. But for the rest of the panel, uh, to the in-house lawyers and CFOs in the, in the room, if there was kind of, if there's one thing, one message that you could send to them uh, about legal, legal finance, what would that be? Rocco? Well, I, the one thing is, I, I think, um, the one thing I'd go back to is just being open to looking at um, the financing, the protection uh, to exposure to transverse costs. Just think of doing something different. Look at the options out there. Model it with somebody in finance if you want to, whoever, or do it yourself. I actually am not sure it's that complicated personally, but, but if you need help, go and get help. Just be open to it. It doesn't mean that you'll do it, but you might be surprised how it, it, it could actually be the solution to a particular case. Uh, the, the thing I was, um, was thinking about with this is that, um, as we all know, the, the, the funding market um, has, has expanded a lot in the last, um, in the last few years. Uh, so if you're a GC or a CFO, you've got lots of different options um, for you know, structures, but also you know, funders them, themselves. And uh, I think a, a decision about uh, which funder you ultimately go with um, is similar to a decision about which lawyer you go with. Um, yeah, these are, they're, they're long-term relationships, or at least they should be if, if, if they're working properly. Um, yeah, we were talking earlier about, about duration risk and two to five years, and we all know that that can be, um, that can go on a lot longer. And, and yeah, you're going to be in the trenches with these individuals. There's going to be bumps in the road, difficult conversations at, 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 at times. Um, and fundamentally, you want to be dealing with people who you actually enjoy working with. It's kind of, you know, it's no different from, from um, the, the, the law firm side of things. So I think it's a, it's a choose your funder wisely message. Um, I suppose I'd have two things. Um, the first of which is just repeating what I said before, which is why wouldn't you go and get that uh, second look from somebody who's very experienced? 
And the second thing is, and, and we've seen this uh, with actually the law firms that we deal with, is I, I always think, gosh, look at this, we've got a whole conference going on here. Do you know what we do for a living? We pay bills. It's not that exciting, is it, when you boil it right down? And yet, it generates all this, all this interest, and yes, it evolves and it changes and all of those things, but I think there is sometimes a risk, and we see this with law firms, is that they think that it's more complicated than it is. And yes, you've got to have an agreement and you've got to have all of that, but fundamentally, you know, large businesses, businesses generally, finance almost every aspect of what they do from their property, capital assets, if you're doing trains, planes, whatever. Um, this is just another thing that you might look at as an alternative for using other people's money to pay for you to do something which, as Suba has said, is a pain and it's always a drain and a pain. And I, and I think one shouldn't, I totally agree with you, it's all very well saying to in-house lawyers, um, look, we're gonna take all this financial risk away from you. You still need people internally who have to commit their time. So we do get that, um, and that's an important point. But it's keep, it's keep it simple. As the law firm's advising, keep it simple, because it really, in the end, isn't that complicated. You can make it as complicated as you want. But fundamentally, we're paying the bills, in return for a share of the proceeds, that's it. We have time, a little time for questions if there are any, and I know there might be some in-house lawyers in the audience if they would also potentially just want to talk about their experiences themselves as well. Any questions? In the back. I, it's just something that Susan and Sue have both said um, about the expertise that funders can bring, but then also about the difficulties where if you have a good case, you want to keep it all for yourself. Is there an argument from the in-house perspective to maybe share 10% of the cost with a funder so that you get the funder's expertise and knowledge, and you're not reinventing the wheel every time with these issues? It keeps the funder interested. It builds the whole opportunity for everyone. and. Additionally, when you're on the other side of the table from your counterparty, you can say, we're backed by a funder, and you get the advantage of that. Yeah. So is there an argument maybe about rethinking whether you have to give the whole cake away, or maybe just a slice? And, and we regularly do that with people who have a lot of money. So for example, often the corporate will say, well, we'll keep the adverse cost risk, but can you pay the bills? It's a cash flow thing, right? It's having to write checks out of your budget. So if we can write those checks, we do that. So that's actually very common. It's a really good point. Thank you for reminding us about that. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Mm -hmm. It can be as much as you want it to be. And of course, from our point of view, if somebody says we want to take some of the risk, that only makes us more interested because you've obviously indicated how much you like the case. We're out of time. Are there any other questions from the audience? Well, if not, well, thank you to the panel for an interesting discussion. And Thank you to Brown Rodney for coming on the conference.